interesting. That church, St. Nicholas in Oberndorf, Austria. Yeah. St. Nicholas, you get it? Its organ malfunctioned, and yet from that malfunction comes a beloved Christmas carol translated more than any other Christmas carol in the world has ever been, Silent Night. You know, the, the, the Silent Night, the way people heard about Silent Night was interesting as well. It wasn't because of the musicians that wrote it or the person who penned the lyrics. The re reason that Silent Night became so popular and spread so much was because of the organ. The organ repairman who came afterwards and heard the story and spread it around as he went around and repaired other organs in Austria and the surrounding territories. You never know who God can use to spread his story. Think back to that original manger scene, if you will, the picture it in your mind. Now, we may sing Silent Night, and we will sing it in a little bit, I'll, don't worry. And we may think Holy Night, Silent Night, but we got to be real too, right? It's a barn. It wouldn't be silent, would it? What sounds can you imagine that you hear there? The, the cattle lowing, the, the sheep bleeding, the donkeys neighing. You, you, maybe you, you hear the sound of shepherds entering into a manger to see this thing that has happened. The sound of angels pronouncing this message, the excitement, the, the joy, and, 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 and the pain too. I mean, Mary just went through childbirth. And despite us singing a moment ago that little Lord Jesus, no crying he made, as we talked about last week in the series, that is complete heresy. Of course Jesus cried. He's a baby. That's what babies do. And there's nothing wrong with a baby who cries. We expect it. In fact, we expect it, especially of Jesus who cries over things that are broken in this world. We expect it over about Jesus because his heart is breaking. It's those tears that are the reason he's come into this world. But there is one person in the story of Christmas, that first Christmas, who we never hear anything from. All of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the eyewitnesses and the near eyewitnesses to what happened that night in Bethlehem, none of them record him ever saying a word. Only two of them mention him in the story at all, and only one of them really spends any amount of time with him. Yet without him, without him, things would have been different. And the person that, I, that I'm referring to, the silent voice in Christmas, is none other than, than Joseph himself. There at a place of prominence, even in our manger scene there. Watching over a son that he knows isn't his. May, uh, marveling at perhaps the message of who, who this son is. Matthew tells us a little bit about him, that he is connected to King David, to Abraham and Isaac, those who have gone before him. But he's no king. He's no royalty. He's no priest. He's no prophet. He's just a carpenter. And the Greek word for carpenter there is just basically a blue-collar kind of laborer worker. You wouldn't have noticed him, except for whose son he had to take care of, for whose son he took care of has his very own. We can miss the wonder and the majesty of that first Christmas. And so easily gloss over Joseph's role in the story. So I want to read for you again that section of scripture that, that we heard read a moment ago from Matthew chapter 1, which tells us more about this story of Joseph. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. We can quickly gloss past Joseph's story and role in, the, in this whole nativity scene so, so quickly. This person who never says a word, but yes, plays such an important role and whose life has been completely turned upside down. I mean, think about it. He's pledged to, to be married. He's, in, he's engaged to marry. 
And he finds out from Mary, first and foremost, that she is pregnant, and he knows for sure he is not the father of this child. He hasn't been with her. And getting that message turns his whole world upside down, but he has every right to do some pretty, pretty drastic things according to the law. But he chooses not the path of getting even, or retribution, or anger. In fact, Matthew gives him a descriptor word, one word, that he was a righteous man, a righteous man, that he chose a different path, a path that was laid out from the angel himself, a path from the angel that said to take Mary home as his wife and to be given an important task. I don't know if you caught it in there, but the important task that Joseph was given, in fact, it's the only word we know Joseph ever spoke, for sure, and that was the name of his son, Jesus. You see, for a man to name his son, to call a boy, to give him his name, is a signifying and saying in that culture that this is my child. And now we know it's not his child by birth, but what he's saying is this child is under my tutelage, this child is under my care, this child is under my protection, this Jesus, this Emmanuel, God with us. It's the only word we know Joseph ever spoke was the name Jesus. And how he spoke that was carried out not so much in the words he says, but his actions. You know, Joseph's one of those rare characters in the scriptures is that he gets an angel visit, not once, but not twice, but three different times. And in each of the times, the angel is going to pretty much upset his plans. The first time it's to announce the birth of Jesus, to announce that this is God coming in the body, in the flesh, in Mary. The second time that he receives a message from an angel is to tell him to to leave Israel and to take his family and to move to Egypt. Now he's had a family collapse. Now he's going to have economic collapse. He's going to have to leave his job. He's going to have to live as a refugee in Egypt because the message is spreading that Herod is trying to kill all the little boys under two years old that were born in Bethlehem, of whom Jesus would be included. And so he goes and lives in Egypt. After some time, Herod passes away, and the third time, an angel appears to him and tells him, it's okay, you can return back to your homeland, you can settle back down. Now, I know sometimes when it comes to hearing from God, all of us have had a desire sometimes to maybe have that kind of angelic messenger tell us what we're supposed to do. Now, if you've ever had that thought, if you've ever had that desire, one thing I would encourage you to do before you ever have that desire again is to read your Bible. Because every time an angel appears to somebody, it's not necessarily going, uh, going to fulfill what you want the angel to bring about. In fact, more often than not, the angel is about ready to appear and upset just about every plan you might have had for your life. But surprisingly, even those upset plans, God's will is still being carried out. His plan is still unfolding. You know, the role of Joseph isn't in the story of the nativity isn't that big, but yet it's a significant one, not because of what he says, but because of what he does. That righteous character and actions speaks very loudly. It's maybe a good question for us, especially guys during this time of, of year. What do we want to be known for? We want to be known as, as the man's man, the guy's guy. Do we want to know about the, the guy who always gets ahead in work, the guy who always gets the job done, the guy who, who sacrifices everything in order to get ahead? Or do we want to be known as the one who leads our, our families, to lead with righteousness, to lead with integrity, to value something greater than the mighty dollar, but to value the care of those who are entrusted to us, those who are a part of our family, those who God has placed into our life to make an eternal difference on. You know, when we want to hear from God, we don't need to ask for angels. We don't need the angels to come and to deliver us a message from Him. We've got His Word. When we want to hear from God, we just open that Word, and and He's willing to, to speak to us, to tell us exactly His plan to tell us exactly what he's up to in this world. My encouragement in this season for you as you're filled with so many things, as this season is filled with so many songs, so many carols, so many parties, so many things you've got to go to, that you can find a time, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, 
to do something that seems pretty extraordinary and hard to do this season. To be silent. To be still. To think of that, that, that carol, silent night, holy night. Can we be silent enough to hear from God? To hear what he said? And not in some mystical, majestical way by an angel coming to us. I mean, if that happens, God bless you. I'll pray for you. But something as simple as his word, which he makes known to us his plans, his desires, his love for us. We can hear from God. I put some suggestions there on the back of your bulletin, your outline, to think about and reflect on this week. Some of them is, are from Scripture, but, but in that song, as I was, I was just digging into Silent Night, I, I found out that when Silent Night was, was first written, it wasn't just three stanzas. It was actually written as a six-stanza poem. Three of them were never used. But yet, there's those three are, are on your outline there. Maybe some ways to kind of reflect a little bit this week. You see, being in God's Word isn't a burden. It's not something we can rather fit in our schedule, but rather an opportunity to get clarity and direction and hope in the midst of whatever life is throwing at us. A time to be silent. An opportunity to hear from the one who loves us, who came for us, and who's promised, I'm coming again. I'm coming again so that you may be where I may be. And that those tears that you cry because of the brokenness and the hardness of this time of season as well, they'll be no more because you'll be in my presence. For I have not just come to make a way in a manger, but a way through a cross and an empty grave so that the grave would have no power over you as well. May God fill you with that hope this Christmas season. May he fill you with his word. And may you find in the midst of the noise that silence for him to speak to you once again. His words of love, of belonging. You are his son, his daughter, whom he has chosen. Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you this day grateful that you came first to us, not because we were deserving, not because we could earn your favor, not because of anything we could do for you, but because of everything you could do for us. Lord, we thank you for people like, like Joseph. Joseph, who, while we know, never said a word other than your name, through his actions showed mighty and powerful things. So, Lord, we might not have the right words at times, but give us the right action so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, others would be filled with the hope that comes with what you have come to bring and do for us. Lord, help us in this season to find this time to be silent and still so that we can hear from you. That in the midst of the noise and the chaos around us, in that silence, we would hear of your great love for us, you choosing us, and we are your sons and your daughters. Fill us with that hope this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.